Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Forge Focus 2023. My name is Birgit Martin, and I'm the chair of the Ontario Forge Council. I'm pleased to see you all here today for our final of three noontime forage webinars. Before we get into today's topic, there are some housekeeping items to make you aware of. Number one, if you have any questions for our speaker, please put them in the chat at any time. OMAFRA's forage and grazing specialist, Christine O'Reilly, will read them to the presenter. And I'd also like to take the time right now to recognize our partners that are presenting this conference. They are us here at the Ontario Forage Council and the Dairy Farmers of Ontario. And so now today's 2023 Forage Focus webinar. Today's webinar is a two-part webinar. First is the value of forages and crop rotations with Pat Lynch. Following that, we will hear from Fritz Troutmansdorf. He will be talking about the cash crop opportunities for hay. But first, Pat. Pat Lynch holds a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and a Master of Science in Corn Breeding from the University of Guelph. A former OMAFRA soils and crop specialist, Pat started a crop consulting venture and with Cargill grew it to encompass farmers and agronomists in Ontario, Western Canada, and two states in the US. Along with the CCA Ontario, Jonathan Zettler, Pat writes a weekly crop production newsletter. He also writes a regular column in Better Farming and speaks at various crop production functions, sales meetings, and farmer meetings. Pat works intensively with small groups of farmers and small independent seed companies as their agronomist. He is the winner of various awards, including the T.R. Hilliard Distinguished Agricultural Extension Person, OAC Outstanding Service Award, Perth County Agriculture Hall of Fame, and a place in the Ontario Agriculture Hall of Fame. Welcome, Pat. To Forge Focus, the floor is now yours. Uh, Bridget, I'm very pleased to be here, proud to be here. I've spent a lot of years, a lot of time with forages, and uh, I'm uh, pleased to be able to do, uh, to do this. So I want to talk about the value of hay as a cash crop. And right from the start, I'm going to tell you that I've got a, uh, a vested interest to, to put out there. I want more acres of forages in Ontario, period. I'm not going to whine and complain about all the acres we've lost because that's not going to do any good. But what I want to do is just put a different dimension on uh, using hay as a cash crop. The how, the why, the what. So the benefits of forages. This past year, we saw the benefits of rotation. I had a comment from Alan McCallum. He's a crop consultant down in Elgin County. And he says, well, you know, you and Dave Hucker and all the other people who have been talking about rotations, you can sure see the benefit of this this year. And the reality is we all know the benefits of rotation, but not everybody's willing to do it. And I'm going to try and suggest and promote the fact that, hey, let's do it. Time's right. Let's get doing it. So what, what goes on is fields with rotation are more capable of handling weather stress, whether it's too wet or too dry. And that's what we had this year. We had too wet, then we had too uh, dry. And if you don't think we're going to have more extreme weather events in the near future, you would be in a minority. Everybody that I listen to that is, knows much about weather say, yeah, we're, we're going to expect that. We're going to have more rain come in a short period of time. We're going to have more periods of hot and dry, and that's who it is. And the reality is that fields that were in forages uh, are more capable of handling these stresses. So then the question is, why? And, and this is where I struggle for a long time to try and get into people's heads why forages are benefit. So we know we've got proof, and if you don't believe it, I feel sorry for you, but forages build soil organic carbon. Big deal, so what? If they build soil organic carbon, it holds soil moisture. Okay, so what? Well, when we get these severe weather events, a lot of rain in a short period of time, soils that have a history of 
forages, they're going to hold it. And also soils with that organic matter, it improves the soil structure. Now, improving soil structure is like motherhood, everybody wants it, but there are many reasons to improve soil structure. One very dollars and cents one is that if you've got better soil structure, all the nutrients that are in there are going to be more available to the plant. If you have tight soils all tied up so the roots can't get in the parts of the soil, those nutrients that are in the soil that you're counting on because the soil that I said they were there, they're not there. The roots can't get at it. So that's why we need that soil structure. The other thing with the, the forages is nitrogen to succeeding crops. And I'm going to whine a little bit about this nitrogen to succeeding crops because we know there is nitrogen there. We just don't have a really great handle on how much. It is a slow release organic nitrogen. It's a non-volatile nitrogen. And with the, the push for um, you know having less greenhouse gases, this is the original organic, non-volatile, uh, slow-release nitrogen. That's the best nitrogen that you can get. Forages reduce compaction. Well, they really don't reduce compaction because the forage fields, you know, they really get compacted. But what it does is those forage roots break down, then that soil is in much better condition to withstand everything that's going on. So we say it reduces compaction, but really what it means is if you've compacted the soil, the crops growing there after forages are going to do better because you did compact it. And this is one um, rotation with forages for two or three year and kills weeds. And we do have a weed epidemic going on right now, especially with the the new weeds with the water hemp, with the tra or with the glyphosate resistant weeds, um, and this nice little baby coming in called amaranth. And what happens in the forage fields is these weed seeds germinate and die. They don't get a chance to grow. So growing forages in a rotation is a great way to reduce your weed bank. And everybody knows, I don't have to explain, if you have a perennial forage growing there, you know, for a number of months, there's just less rotation. Okay, so this will probably be, I hope, the only chart that will bore you, but this is from the long-term research uh, at University of Guelph. I'm pretty sure it started by Terry Daynard, carried on by Tony By, then by Bill Dean, and, and Dave Hooker's now carrying it on. But what it is, is it's the soil organic carbon measured a couple of different ways. And with different rotations, continuous corn, corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans, wheat, um, with red clover, corn, alfalfa, and alfalfa. And as you can see, the soil organic carbon, once you have forages in there, the soil organic carbon in the top 20 centimeters, top eight inches, is better with forages in there. But probably a different and better way to describe it is the total amount of carbon per, per pound, per kilogram of soil. And this is where the forage is really, really shine is, is when they have the, um, you know, a, a long-term stand of forages, the soil organic carbon um, increases. And it, it's just interesting. There was a, a YouTube, uh, YouTube presentation from the Soil Health just this past week, again, commenting on how rotations are a main way to be building up soil organic carbon. Forages reduce weeds. Now, if you are a cash cropper or work with cash cropper, and if they're not worried about some of these things like Canada flea bane, then you better get them worried. Canada flea bane, most seeds germinate in the first year. And this is a very good way to really eliminate all the, the Canada flea bane that's in your soil can't stop the neighbors from coming in, but you you can eliminate, you know, the ones that are on your field. So in the forage crop, the weeds germinate and die. Pretty simple system. Annual grasses like foxtail are normally not a problem after three years of forages. I don't have any research to, to document this. What I do have is experience uh, after scouting, making recommendations on thousands of acres, 
we notice that the the foxtails are are barely almost non-existent in the first year of corn after a forage. So this means when you're using um, using a germanicide, then you can use lower rates. You may not even have to use the first year of corn. I've got a bit of a scratchy voice. I've got to do wet. But now, perennial weeds, we've gone into a, a system in, uh, of less tillage and no till, and this controls the annual weeds good, but the perennial weeds have taken off. And one of the best ways to control perennial weeds is just by constantly cutting and smothering them. So if you've got a field with perennial sow, thistle, milkweed, dogbane, all of those weeds, you put it into forages for three or four years, and it's good by perennial sow, thistle, milkweed, and dogbane. I don't have as much experience with vetch because it, it's a, kind of a low growing one. I'm not 100% sure, but I know with these other weeds, you got a problem feel with it that you've tried everything, especially the perennial sow thistle, get that field in the forages. This is the other sheet that is a little bit um, big, a lot of numbers. <clears throat> so it's a OMAFRA worksheet and you can see the various numbers put in for the cost of production. So you end up down here with the cost of production. You can go onto the OMAFRA website and pull this and work through your own. Now with this, you know, down at the bottom, there's nitrogen credit, grain yield increase. And what I've done is I've gone back and pulled out numbers from various researches. And this is what I get. I get a nitrogen credit for 140 to 150 pounds. So where do I get this? This is from uh, the land grant colleges, Northern US states where they give 120 to 180 pounds of nitrogen credit uh, to the first year of, of corn after coming out of an alfalfa rotation. They also give a nitrogen credit to the second year if you should be needing it as going into corn, which we really don't want you to do. But if you do, there's even a nitrogen credit. There is a nitrogen credit for alfalfa and grasses as well in their, um, in their calculations. In Ontario, we really don't know. We don't have any current nitrogen credit research for forages. And if I could plea with the Ontario Forage Council or anybody else out there that's listening, we need some fairly simple research on a nitrogen credit to forages. Uh, I, I talked to uh, uh, Greg at, at uh, his private research and he said, yeah, we could we could do a trial, a fairly simple trial for five or six thousand dollars to come up with a value of nitrogen. But this is research, fairly simple research that should be done in Ontario. How much nitrogen credit do we give a forage stand? So the problem is setting it out, you know, do you set it out uh, corn on alfalfa at various rates or corn versus uh, that was coming out of soybeans. It's a little bit hard to set it up, but we definitely need some better numbers. So I put a nitrogen credit value to succeeding crops of $100, $150. Increase in corn yield. <clears throat> this one's well documented by research trials, both in Ontario and other places um, that a 25% yield increase for the first year in corn after forages, that's sort of a minimum. So at the current price of, of $6 a bushel, that's $300. Increase in soybeans, again, this is long-term. Again, uh, the most um, you know central would be research coming out of the University of Guelph and Alora. A 25% increase of 50 bushels at today's price, $200. So the value of the nitrogen and increase in corn and increase in soybean, they're $600. And that value never gets put into the value virtue revenue from alfalfa. Reduced weed control costs, I'm not sure what it is. I know that there is a reduced cost. So when you are looking at revenue from alfalfa, these are things that you have to, to, to get into. 
Uh, I did have two farmers last year who did put out nitrogen plots on their farm to see how much nitrogen credit they could get. I checked again yesterday and they still don't have their yield maps back. So we reduced, we did some nitrogen trial work, but we don't have, we don't have the numbers back. We know that they can easily reduce their nitrogen rate. We just don't know by how much. Okay. Again, that's kind of hairy. Economics of, of growing hay. <laughs> so these are from the budget sheets, three year average, average yield, returns, nitrogen. But you know what? I, I'm not I'm not sure. When I look at those budgets, I know that if you use your old equipment, uh, get higher selling price, and if you soil test, there's probably many ways to reduce those costs. Now I put in a dollar value for hay and Fritz hopefully will give us some better numbers uh, later this afternoon. But I just took this from the US hay price November 21st this year. And these are the ranges, you know, uh, up as high as 325 US for premium hay down to 100, 125 in Missouri for fair hay. But this is part of selling hay if you're new to the business. You know, um, it, it's not like checking the Chicago Board of Trade to see how much it is. There are many different ways of of uh, coming up with a price for that hay. And and other than that, I'm not going to say anything, but just, just know that there are different numbers. Forage markets. <clears throat> The reality of the forage market, you got to find your own market. Now, Fritz will talk about the hay co-op and there are other places, but the hay forage market is a little bit secretive. And I know people who are selling hay and I, it's one of those things you just don't want to ask where they're selling it to because these individuals have spent a lot of time getting their own forage market and they're not going to tell anybody. So you have to get your own market. You can start with local dairy farms. <clears throat> Some of them are want to spend time in the barn, would rather not be out in the field. And that would be one place where you could work with local dairy farmers to grow hay for them and let them grow corn on their own fields. There is a market of exporting into the US and uh, some individual farmers are doing it and companies are doing it as well. The Ontario Forage Council, their website, uh, there's places there that you could you could list. So the other thing is you got to use a bit of imagination. Now, whether you list in your own local paper or you go on Kijiji or you go on the Ontario Farmer and you got to start. Like, I want to grow hay, so I got to find a market. So you put it out there. So whether you talk to dairy farmers, or you put the ads in the paper, or somehow you just get it out there. I want to get it. The GG and Twitter, I, I was surprised when on there, the number going on there. There is a small bale horse market, labor intensive. However, there are some young people out there that are willing to work and don't realize that some of us older people think that's a slave market. But there are there is a market for small bales. The horse um, industry in Ontario is definitely increasing. So there is that market. Okay, how would a cash cropper fit hay in the rotation? First of all, you got to find a buyer. <laughs> it's not a case I'm just going to go out and grow hay and then sell it. Doesn't work that way. You got to you got to find your buyer. Then you got to decide on what you're going to plant, uh, and that's going to be dictated by the buyer. Unless you've got a specific market, you know what? I'm going to grow it. I'm going to target that market. But knowing what the buyer wants is going to decide what you. So you can, most cash croppers, seed, fertilizer, control, weed yourself. So when you take a look at that cost of production, you can take a look at, at those numbers. You can hire someone to, har for, to harvest forage, you know, whether it, it's going to be bales, it's going to be big bales. And there are lots of uh, farmers or custom people willing to do custom forage harvest. <clears throat> you got to figure out how to store and deliver. Uh, you may have your own resources to deliver, but the storing, that's a bit of a stumbling block. 
Now, if you've got um, a neighbor or you yourself are into poultry or hogs, that's a great place to grow forages. Number one, uh, you can really reduce your fertilizer values or amount supplied if you've got near field. And I guess the other thing is that if you are growing forages on a, a field that's high in P and K because of manure, this is a great way to, well, it's not a great way, but you can lower phosphate and potash levels on manured fields by taking a lot of forage off and putting on no fertilizer. So if you got a, a hog guy next door is always looking for someplace to get rid of manure, you can help him to be able to put more manure on his own fields by growing forages there and reducing it. Now, if you're in the corn rootworm area, then one year of forages breaks the cycle. And I didn't put that value into the increased corn yield, but some years that could be half of the corn crop. So that is a phenomenal yield booster in those areas with corn rootworms. The other obvious thing that if you're into selling hay to buy hay and straw sales is a no brainer. Uh, or if you're in hay, then you should be selling straw. Or if you're in the straw, think about selling hay. So what fields are most appropriate? <clears throat> One of them that I look at would be rented land. And what you do is you talk to the landlord and talk to them about the value of putting forages into their land. And if you are renting land and you can put forages on that rental land, you're more apt to get a long-term rental agreement as to somebody who's just going to come in and grow the crops and maybe not take take that good care of it. Most, most landlords realize I should be doing something for the long-term benefit of my soil, not with putting forages in there. Land that is well drained but not produced well because of too many years without forages. <clears throat> and often I hear cash crop say, well, look at the corn on that dairy guy's farm. Boy, he sure knows how to grow good, good corn. Well, that's because of the forages that are in there. So if you've got a field that's not really doing that well, get it in the forages. Really the best forage fields are the best corn and soybeans. Now, if you have heavy soil that's unproductive, that's great grassland. And the reality is across Ontario, we've got a bunch of land that was taken out of grass that should never have been, and that's some of that heavy soil. Best way to, to do anything with that land is get it back in. And it may only be, you know, parts of fields, parts of farm, but some of this heavy land, put it in the grass. Fields going into edible beans is an absolute no-brainer. Um, when I was the edible bean specialist in Perth and Huron counties, it was very often an edible bean grower would get fields that were in forages. And the first year was really good edible bean yields. Second year was even better. And if you're into the edible beans or if you've got an edible bean grower in your area, growing fields with forages and then renting that land to them or somehow working out a deal, that's an obvious. <clears throat> The other one is, is vegetables. You know, the, the vegetable growers, I'm sure, realize the benefit of forages in the rotation. So if you can work with vegetable growers and, and grow forages on the fields that they want to uh, put into horticulture crops, that's a win-win. And you can think about small fields that you could put into forages, but still harvest effectively. Some of these fields that, you know, it's just a bit of a nuisance to get all the big equipment down there. Those would be natural forage fields. Low wetland, a lot of farms have got low wetland. That would be a place for grass. And switch grass is one of those grasses that yields well. There is a market for it. And uh, you, you can put that land into, into switch grass and leave it there for six, seven, eight years. Fields with perennial weeds like perennial sow thistle, again, mentioned before, are obvious no brainers to put into forages. <clears throat> so here are some of the simple basics of forage production for the uh, first time. You got a soil test, figure out the pH. Need a starter fertilizer high in phosphorus unless the soil is testing really high in phosphorus as in a lot of manure from poultry or, or hogs. 
you need annual sulfur applications. This is just one of the things that uh, you're going to grow forage and you got to put sulfur on every year. <clears throat> you can direct seed or use a companion crop. Some producers like it going one way, others like it the other way. So both systems work. One thing if your uh, corn, beans, wheat producer would be to direct seed or to seed after winter wheat harvest. There's a lot of really good stands of alfalfa that are seeded after winter wheat. <clears throat> you must control the weeds either with a cover crop or herbicides and, and both systems work. Now, <clears throat> if you've got um, certain weeds that are hard to control, such as chickweed, which can be a real nuisance in establishing alfalfa, uh, or some other weeds in your area. Use of Harvextra, the glyphosate-resistant alfalfa variety, allows for alternate weed control. Where plant forage, soil type dictates which forage species. It's very simple. Best corn land is built. Heavy soil produced poor corn crop is the best for grasses, but the pH must be addressed. Now, some of the issues with, just a second, good thing to sip here. Some of the issues with cash croppers growing forages. Mm -hmm. Storage, you need inside storage. You know, wrapping the bales and leaving them outside, you're really not gonna cut it. Now you might be able to find a market with that if you're working with an individual farmer who's buying from you, but no, you really need storage. Harvesting, there is lots of custom harvesters, <clears throat> but you must have a quality product to sell. If you are trying to sell corn and it's high and done, you know, nobody's going to want it. It's the same with forages. It's got to be a quality product. If you're trying to grow IP soybean and they're dirty and messy, it's not going to sell. Here are, are some of the other production things. To get maximum production, you got to have boron. And this is one of the oldest fertilizer recommendations that went back to one of my predecessors, Harvey Wright, who found that a pound of boron every year, you know, that was the way to increase yield. In certain areas of province, you have to watch magnesium. <clears throat> one fact that is argued, but the research is black and white, three cuts outproduce four cuts. Three cuts of alfalfa gives you a higher yield than four cuts. And if you go to one, you know, some of the forages to maintain their quality, like a hard extra, you can maintain quality with a, with a three cut system. <clears throat> you can underseed and then sell the nurse crop. This reduces the need for, for herbicide and weed cook. So <clears throat> my voice is sort of leaving me and uh, Christine and, and and Bridget, this will give me a chance to catch my breath. So I know I didn't go the full 45 minutes, but uh, probably if there's a chance for some questions, we'll do that. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, yeah, so just a reminder to everybody, if you've got questions for Pat, please stick them in the chat and I will field them uh, for you. So Pat, my first question for you is, what is the biggest challenge that your clients face when they're growing hay? Ah, uh, great question. Fairly simple. Where to sell? Where to sell forages? You know, growing forages is, is is fairly simple. When you take a look at the complications of all the other crops, corn, edible beans, wheat, you know, growing forages is fairly simple. Uh, but weed control, it, it would be the top production thing. But for new people growing forages, you know, finding that market and selling it, that's the number one challenge. Figure that one out, and then there's lots of people to help you grow forages. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I admit I was not expecting you to say marketing because uh, I I had a production challenge in mind, but the weed control, I think, is, is a great answer. Um, so what is the cutoff pH for determining whether or not you should be applying lime? Uh, good question. So 
with lime, what at a pH of seven, a lot of nutrients become more available, especially phosphorus. So we can grow crops, you know, we can grow corn down under five, but uh, we shouldn't be doing that. We should get the pH up. So I want, I really want a minimum of 6.5, 6.7, 6.8. Why? Well, pH fluctuates during the season. So if you take a soil sample and it's nah, 6.5, well, it could be 6.7 or it could be 6.3. So I want to have some buffer built into it. Um, and I, you know, the soil pH, that was one of the first things that was done in Ontario with soil dust, just correcting the pH. But we know so little still about soil pH and how it affects the other nutrients. So if I had, it's got to be a minimum of 6.5. Now saying that you can grow, there are species that will grow at lower pH. And if, if you just don't want to be doing the pH, well, then pick one of those species that will grow at a lower pH. So that's a segue into the next question. What other species could be grown that might perform like alfalfa, but would be better suited to low pH soils? <laughs> Trick question, eh, Christine? It's well, a tough one. Alfalfa is the queen of the forages. You know, corn is king, alfalfa is the queen. And uh, together in the dairy farms that are king and queen is great match. So there is no other forage like alfalfa in terms of the total package. Um, but, you know, things like red clover, alcyc, and the grasses, they'll grow at their lower pHs. Uh, but then again, it comes to, you know, when you're picking your forage mix, number one, if you're getting the hay market, you got to figure out who your buyer is, then you grow for the buyer. Then you take a look at the soil, and then you decide, okay, what species are going to grow best there? And each species, like I work working with a couple of seed companies, and some of them have multiple mixes, like a lot of species. I said, why are you getting so many species? Well, Patrick, some of this land is very variable. In this part of the field, this species grows best. This part of the field, this grows best. And we've got three different areas in those fields, and they don't want to see them all differently. So we put in a blend and we know some are going to die here and some are going to do better there. So you end up doing a blend of, of species. Now, Christine, this is this is for the grasses. I'm not mm -hmm. too big on blending legumes, but you you know, putting in a base legume and then and then putting mixtures of grasses. So just to continue on that vein, um, are you familiar with Galega? at all and do you have any thoughts on that crop i i've been following uh the research that's going on with it is this a question from northern ontario it is yes yeah uh the it sure looks interesting from the research that i look at but no i've not seen any in southern ontario so and it looks like it looks like something in the growers in that area uh, should be looking at for sure and I was told it was tried at Alora in the 80s and it's summer killed. So that tells me it's probably better suited to Northern Ontario kind of climate conditions. It's, it's native yeah. to Scandinavia. So, um, um, yeah. So um, which forage is most profitable or in higher demand these days? This is not related to Galega at all. This is just in general. Is is there something that is? Um, well, you know, demand? it's pretty Kaley, which I really am not in love with. <laughs> okay. Uh, so excluding pretty Kaley and all those cereals for forage production, the, the cereals for forage production go against my desire to have a forage down for two or three years in the same field. So which one is most in demand? It depends on the market and comes back to, you know, and alfalfa is very good. Timothy is very good. A grass mix is good. Uh, the buyers, the, the, the hay, dry hay buyers are, they're fickle 
and they've got you know definite demands like some of the horse buyers they want to see timothy heads in the bale why well because i was always told that timothy's good for horses so i want to see timothy heads well christine you and i know that by the time it's out in the head the, the feed quality has gone way down so what you want the best the best product is what the buyer wants and we have you know there there was a time that some of the switchgrass going into the u.s it was demanding a phenomenal price, just couldn't keep up with the market. Um, and then they were even growing growing switchgrass and putting it into the burners for the uh, greenhouse people. So the most profitable one is whatever the buyer wants. So you find the buyer, decide what they want. That's the most profitable one. Just your comment on the horse. Hey, horses aren't ruminants, so that, that more mature grass is not a problem for their digestive system. But uh, there's a second part to this question. So do you ever recommend um, mixed cocktail type forage for marginal land? I'm not sure if oh, they mean absolutely. annuals or perennials. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All the time. And I'm thinking of our home farm when I was a kid, like if ever there was a place, it would be that type of farm. Yeah, you've got, I can think of some of those fields, and I've been on other fields, you know, since in other parts of the world that this area is low and wet, and it could be 25% of the field. This is 25% is pretty good. And then up on top of the field, it always dries out. It's completely different. So absolutely, yeah, absolutely do different mixes when you're in a field that you just don't want to put different different species in. You don't want to plant it separately. And any thoughts on what forage crop is the least maintenance? The least maintenance? The least maintenance. <laughs> We're grass. trying to get you guys to manage your forage crops. I'm not I'm not sure that we want to have one well, that's least maintenance, but uh... No, it, it's grass. And I'm not gonna say who, but I I not a good friend, but a friend of somebody, a cash cropper who sells forages. And I asked him, so how long are you living down? Well, I guess I'm probably not doing the best as what I should be doing because some of these fields are down four and five years. And that's, he's not managing them. He's He's got it there and it's sort of, okay, I can make some money off that and I don't have to worry about it and it's out of, the, it's out of it. But no, and Christine, you you touch on a really good thing. Once we start managing forages, and, and many growers are, many growers are, but if we manage forages like corn, beans, and wheat, then we actually don't need as many acres because you look at the yields of corn, beans, and wheat, and they got up and the forage yields have not gone up, but some individual farmers, the yields have gone up. Some of those individual farmers, though, they're still leaving them down too long, and, and that's because they don't realize the nitrogen credit, which we need research. They don't realize the yield increase, which we need research. Um, we just have to manage our forages better, differently. That, you know, they're not, they're not the poor crop. They can be a very significant crop. And if we ever get this export market going, like if, I, if I'm thinking, okay, where's one of the safest places in the world? Probably Canada. Where's one of the countries with the toughest uh, pesticide regulation of the world, probably Canada, maybe Ontario, even that. So where would be the safest place to buy your forages from? Oh, Ontario. And and we're really missing that that market edge or that, that thing. If I was very fussy and wanted to be buying forages, I'd be buying it from Ontario. Now we just got to get the Ontario farmers to grow it. And then we got to win-win. We can buy and sell. All right, so one more question, and this one circles back to that earlier one about lime. Um, sometimes there's not budget for both lime and fertilizer. Sometimes it's tricky to get lime into some parts of Ontario that need it. So if the budget doesn't cover both, do you spend the money on the lime or do you spend the money on the fertilizer? No, you got to get the pH right first because the pH affects it. But... That you know, not having money for both, that's that's not a realistic question. Uh I was like say, I got I got money to buy cows, but I can't buy quota. Which one should I buy? Well, one without the other is no good. The same with lime and forages. You gotta have both. 
So I would do it. Okay. How many acres? Well, 100, but I can't. Okay, well, let's do 50 and do it right. We'll get the pH corrected. It, you know, Christy, a little side. I do work with with uh, seed companies, got customers across Canada. They, they go into Newfoundland and, and they send me the soil test. I don't believe this pH. Oh, yeah. Would you know how many tons of lime you got to put on that? Oh, yeah. Like, you're looking at six, seven tons of lime. We know, but you can't put that on the, at one shot. We know. So, but but here in Newfoundland, these are dairy farmers and they're serious about it and they're going to get it done. So if we say somebody in the dairy can't afford lime and fertilizer in the same forage field, it's not all adding up. Something's, there's a little piece there. They could sell their new truck, hey, Christine, and get some lime. <laughs> <laughs> all right, no, well, kidding. on- Good. <laughs> well, um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in at this point. So, Pat, thank you so much. And I'm going to pass things over to Birgit. Okay. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we're going to go to part two of our webinar now. And uh, we're going to introduce Fritz Troutsmandorf. He is the president of the Ontario Hay and Forage Co op. He is the owner of Dunley Farms. It's a cash crop farm in the Jerseyville area of Ontario. And he is going to talk about the cash crop opportunities for hay to follow up on what Pat's been talking about. So Fritz, the floor is yours. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, yeah, all good. Okay, you can hear me now? Okay. So uh, it was great to hear Patrick again. And um, some of the things I wanted to say, he brought up already and explained very well, especially the agronomic benefits of growing hay. And uh, so I don't have to preach to the community the second time. And, um, but I want to explain what is the OHFC. And as the discussion that Patrick had and uh, with Christine, where do you sell the stuff when you grow hay and forages in Ontario? So that question came up already maybe eight years ago, or it's a permanent question in Ontario, what to do with the damn stuff when you grow it. And uh, so there was a group of us in the export committee of the Ontario Forage Council, and we got together and formed a cooperative with the distinct purpose of growing um, hay in Ontario for overseas exports with containers. It took a few years to get it going, but we have it going now and uh, are shipping uh, quite a bit of hay into the Middle East, India, um, Qatar, UAE, Oman, and Kuwait. And uh, this is starting to grow quite well, but we do need more hay. And so what we try to do is uh, teach farmers to grow the right hay for these markets for having a sellable crop. So what is export quality hay? The, there's basically two types of hay. One is pure Timothy, one is pure alfalfa. And we have now succeeded over the last few months to introduce into those markets Timothy alfalfa mixes and also Timothy orchard mixes. And that expands the um, hay markets and the access to markets quite substantially for Ontario farmers, because those are the types of hay that are grown a lot. One thing that Pat might not, did not mention when you talk about quality hay is that people that are serious about growing hay for selling it and for export need to have access to a hay dryer. 
There are now some very high quality and good uh, hair dryers for big square bales. And I always tell people you wouldn't grow corn if you wouldn't have access to a dryer. Why do you try that with hay? So there's, uh, that is part of um, what we are trying to introduce more and more in Ontario, that farmers have access to dryers and can dry their hay crops and have a very high chance of having high quality hay to sell. And um, so why are we exporting? Because simply there's a huge demand worldwide for good hay. The worldwide hay market is somewhere around 10 to 12 billion US dollars per year. Uh, the whole Gulf region buys basically all its supply of hay for its livestock. And that is cattle, dairy, sheep, goats, camels, horses in millions of tons because they simply don't have uh, the water to irrigate their land to grow the stuff. So they made the decision to buy it from other producers. And other market that's very large is China. And uh, there's also a huge market in uh, Korea, South Korea, Japan. There's a big market in the Caribbean. There's smaller markets in Europe occasionally, in England or even in Southern Europe or Northern Africa. And um, it is a worldwide market. And uh, the main producers for hay in the world, um, US, Canada, and Italy, France, and Spain, and also Argentina. And up to the war, it was uh, Ukraine, but they are kind of having a bit of problem here. So, um, the hay needs to be a very high quality, quality in terms of uh, nutrient value, value cleanless uh, purity, and um, in color. And how do I learn how to grow that stuff? We, as the co-op, produced uh, a Timothy guide for Ontario hay at ontariohay.ca. There's a resource page. That's uh, working, and we are working to provide additional grower resources and support. And um, so, anybody who comes to us and wants to know and needs help how to grow it right, how to do it right, we are more than willing to help. And uh, so, go to ontariohay.ca, contact us, and uh, we can initiate conversation. How much will I get paid for my hay? At the moment, we pay 16 cents per pound. Um, have delivered to our compression plant in Alma, Ontario. That is for big square bales uh, of export grade quality hay uh, delivered to the plant in Alma. The plant in Alma was built by a group of us. And it is specifically designed to double compact um, large quantities of hay to maximize the loads in containers. That plant can produce, uh, can uh, do up to 35,000 tons a year. So it's a massive enterprise and a massive uh, plant. So in the moment, at the moment, we are basically charging getting higher supplies, getting bigger markets, getting more people to store and dry it. So to bring all those factors up together and increase the, the amount of hay grown in Ontario. And um, in terms of what constitutes um, export quality hay, that is described already by Pat and myself, it needs to be pure. It needs to be clean, it needs to be dry, it needs to be 12%. And um, it needs to be well packed and well stored inside, off the ground on skits and all those things. But those are all things we can teach you. Um, a payment for the hay will be issued upon processing. And um, um, it's pretty good money for good hay. 
is you do a good job growing it, it's as good as corn or soya beans. And where do I find more information? OntarioA.ca. How do I sign up? You can become a member of the OHFC. You can contact Ontario Hay and Forage at Outlook.com. You will be talking to Patricia Ellingwood, our administrator, and she can uh, help you become a member. It's a one time fee of $1,000. And that gets you into the loop and into the information packages and, uh, and into the cooperative efforts that we are making to increase hay production and hay markets and hay drying in Ontario. Ontario is extremely well suited for selling hay. Um, yeah, we have that. Ontario is very well suited, as Pat already mentioned. For growing hay, but also for marketing hay. We have access to uh, overseas transportation, and uh, many of our group also sell hay into the US and uh, steadily expanding that part of it too. So, um, Alma, Ontario, Chris Martin's farm, where the press is located, is really becoming one of the big hay hubs in Ontario. And um, I'm not sure what else we have there. Um, I'm open to questions or discussion if somebody wants to bring something up. Okay, Fritz, thank you. Um, so, Christine, I'll turn it over to you to um, field any of the questions yep. and pass them to Fritz. Thank you so much, Fritz, on giving us an update from the co-op. Um, yeah, just just a reminder, everyone stick your questions in the chat if you have them. Um, so you're talking about shipping hay to you know the Middle East and some other countries around the world. Have you guys started shipping hay yet? Like, is there hay leaving Ontario already? We have been shipping uh, basically every day now, and. Uh... I think we have to get 21 containers out before Christmas and uh, a bunch of loads to the US uh, that go by truck. So it's moving through the plant uh, at a pretty good clip right now already. And uh, we have standing orders for 20 or 30 containers per month right now. And that's steadily increasing. We're just scrambling to find enough uh, high quality aid. And are your buyers? just looking for pure timothy hay or do they also want any legume grass mixes this is the good part that when we started those markets for historic reason only took uh, pure timothy or pure alfalfa but over the last year and a half or so or two years we have introduced um mixed hay orchard timothy mix and uh, which they call meadow mix and also Timothy alfalfa mix because quite often the customers there they buy a bale of Timothy and a bale of alfalfa and then mix it themselves so um so we told them why the hell are you doing this uh try the premix stuff we're growing you know so we're starting to get quite a bit acceptance of that but uh, it takes a bit of time to do that, but this will allow us to expand our supply of hay very substantially in Ontario. That is exciting, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so we expect to ship about 10,000 tons in 2024, uh, US and overseas. And if we don't, the FCC will come after us for the money for the press, you know what I mean? So <laughs> But uh, we are well on the way to do that. That's really exciting. Yeah. Um, does the co-op help growers make transportation connections to get the hay to the compressing facility in Alma? Yes. Uh, Marhavens themselves have a fleet of trucks. And they have, well, a few, of course, helped uh, bring hay in. 
Some of the big growers that needed the uh, van trailers to help them bring it to the plant dry so they can process it right away. They borrowed trailers from my farm or another farm, you know. So we are kind of working together to make that work. So if a grower has the right kind of hay and needs transportation, that's something we can help on. And I guess what, um, oh, another question came in. Do Does every grower need to have a dryer? Not every grower needs to have a dryer, but it is smart to have one accessible in the area. You know, it just takes the risk out of hay. Like one of the holdbacks, and uh, that's something Pat didn't mention, is um, why is hay disappearing out of Ontario, you know? you got to be really stupid to screw up a, a corn crop. You know? But it's very easy to screw up a hay crop. One little shower, one small mistake in the in the harvesting process, and you've got nothing, you know. And um, so having access to dryers increases the probability that you have high-quality hay, basically to the same risk factor you would have if you grow grain. And that is one of the arguments we are making that by taking that risk factor out of it, it becomes much more um, attractive and um, financially attractive and much more secure to do it, to, to uh, grow the crop. You know? Because you don't risk losing half your crop to an untimely rain or a short window or whatever. And we've got time for one more question. So can you comment on custom processing options for hay growers who want to convert their large square bales to small square bales so they can access markets like the horse hay market? Yes, absolutely. They're very welcome to contact us. And uh, they can do that for a fee that is open to anybody who wants to do that. So you don't have to be a member of the co-op to, no, to no, process bales like that. Yeah, this is actually not done by the co-op. This is uh, done by Hay Press Corporation. Those are the individual that own the press. Because the cooperative buys time on the press to get its hay press. And Marhaven Agri is hired by Hay Press Corporation, owners on the press, to do the work for them. So we had to build build it this way so we could get financing for the price. But okay. it is accessible to anybody who would like to access that service and you're more than welcome to contact us and get some help. All right. Well, thank you so much, Fritz. It's it's always great to hear an update on what the co-op is doing because every time I talk to you. Uh, new and exciting things are happening, and and you guys have built up a lot of momentum. So yeah, no, it's it's going well, and we hope to get more hay and uh, get people interested. Um, we can do a lot of hay in Ontario and do all the farms in Ontario a lot of good, but we have to we have to be able to sell it, otherwise it's no point. And so that's what we're working on. All right, so thank well, you, Christine and Bridget, and. Uh, if anybody still wants to ask questions, they can email me or text me, okay? All right, thank you so much, Fritz. And uh, yeah, I'll turn it back to Birgit to close us out. Okay, thanks, Christine. Thank you, Fritz. Uh, between Pat and Fritz, both excellent presentations. It, I think it's a real eye-opener for the potential for forages in Ontario. It, both very excellent, thank you very much. Um, just to wrap up, um, thank you everybody for, for staying with us and participating in our uh, Forge Focus seminars. I'd like to again thank D Dairy Farmers of Ontario for partnering with us at Ontario Forge Council in presenting Forge Focus. So thank you everyone for participating and um, we'll see you at our next event, which is Profitable Pastures in March of 2024. Thank you.